you know, we're going to basically see an, an aggressive Fed response at some point. And when that occurs, you know, Bitcoin's going to just go nuts. It's going to go straight up. Is the commercial real estate market big enough to cause something like a 2008? The failure of a currency is nothing new. I mean, we have seen there have been a hundred high inflations or hyperinflations in the last 150 years of recorded modern history. But it's never happened with the world's reserve currency before. Uh, there are people in the Bitcoin community who strongly believe that at some point there will just there'll almost be no offer that will just, you know, we'll go from 100,000 to a million to two million just, you know, in, in, in the blink of an eye. And predicting the price of Bitcoin, it's a fool's errand. I mean, it's so hard. It, it's just so hard. It does. It, it's just a wild animal. You don't know what it's going to do. But, you know, one thing is for sure. Bing bong. I am back with another edition of the State of Bitcoin podcast where I have recurring guest. Lawrence Lepard back on the show. So Lawrence, thanks so much for joining me here again today. Hey, but, Brandon. Thanks for having me back. It's always fun chatting with you. Of course, of course. But I want to start it off right away. Obviously, you know, the big news, the Bitcoin ETF, I believe nine of them have passed so far in the United yeah. States. The traditional finance is now coming in, or maybe it adds a little bit of validity behind Bitcoin. So I'll leave it kind of, kind of broad for you here. What do you think that the Bitcoin ETFs mean just for the Bitcoin space in general, as as we're getting this year started, yeah. Well, well, I'm with Sailor. I mean, it's, I think it's an enormously big deal, and we, you know, those of us who knew it was coming, we all had a chance to forerun, you know, trillions of dollars of RIA money. I mean, as, as you know, for those who aren't familiar, and I'm sure most of the listeners aren't familiar with this, but I'll just summarize it quickly. Um, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of investment capital in the United States. It's managed by RIAs, registered investment advisors. And these people are, you know, tasked with, you know, managing retirement accounts and people's savings and so on and so forth. And they can only buy things which are listed on public exchanges. Um, they're not able to, you know, buy Bitcoin off an exchange, put it on a treasure. No, 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 that doesn't work. It's got to be in a brokerage account that they can manage. And so really, you know, they, they only had one or two means of getting any Bitcoin exposure before these uh, Bitcoin ETFs came, the spot ETFs came. And those were... GBTC, which was, the, you know, the grayscale that sold at a discount and which was, by the way, was a pretty interesting play. And then uh, a micro strategy, which is kind of a play on just holding a lot of Bitcoin and what sailors doing there. So but now they can buy Bitcoin and um, and, you know, it's been the best performing financial asset for 15 years. It was up 150 percent last year. And so I think it's going to be very easy and, and there's going to be a trend towards these RIAs saying, hey, you know, this thing is new. It's risky. It's volatile but you need to have a little bit of it. And if we're talking, I've seen various estimates of the size of this RIA pool of capital. I mean, I've seen it as large as 100 trillion. I think that's a little overstated, but it's definitely 20 trillion. Maybe it's, you know, I'm guessing it's 30 or 40 trillion. And so, you know, if, if um, one or 2% of that comes chasing after our market, that's a big number, you know? Um, and so, you know, our market is, is 800, well, now it's higher. It was 850 before we got this recent pump. But uh, um, and as we all know, not all of that 850 is available. I mean, 70 percent of it is in long term hands and some of it's been lost and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I think that as this additional capital comes into the segment, um, this is going to really fuel the next leg of, of you know, price appreciation in Bitcoin. Interesting historical point. When the uh, gold ETF was approved, um, same thing happened. The price of gold took a very, very big rise because prior to that, that ETF being approved, if you wanted to buy gold, you had to go to a coin dealer. And, uh, you know, and people just didn't do that. It was too, too painful. But when they were, you know, when they were told by the broker, hey, you know, we think you should have some exposure to gold and we can do it. We'll just buy this GLD. Um, you know, GLD swelled from a very small size to a very large size. And the price of gold went up, you know, multiples. I, th I think it was like three or four X in the, you know, over a seven or eight year time frame. So um, I, I kind of see the same thing happening here. You know, it's interesting because everyone expected it to happen on the day of, you know, the approval. And I, it's, in, you know, as Wall Street's Wall Street, right? My, my sense is a lot of people had front run it. A lot of futures players had front run it and they had arbed it all out. And so, you know, it, it took a little while. And, and there was the GBTC bleed. You know, a lot of people, GBTC did not cut their fees. So a lot of people sold out of that. So, so there was new money coming in there, old money going out of GBTC. So it was kind of choppy. You know, the day it got approved, a lot of people said, oh, there's going to be a God candle when they approve it. And of course, there wasn't. <laughs> but but, you know, what um, there's some great people on Twitter. Uh, Fred Krueger is one of them, actually, who does who document, you know, kind of the, the relentless buying of these nine ETFs. And, you know, just every day, you know, more and more of these registered investment advisors will tell their clients about it. And as, as you're aware and I'm aware, 
you know, people tend to chase um, new highs. And so, you know, we're getting to a stage now. We're not very far away. I mean, it's a ways, but we're not that far away from potential new high. You know, I think the old high was 68, 69. What are we at 47 now? Um, you know, that could happen. And, uh, you know, and when a new high happens and it's, again, one of the better performing financial assets, you know, you're going to see some of those clients or those RIAs calling up and saying, hey, do we own any Bitcoin? And no, we haven't done it yet. Well, you know, why not? Or, you know, what's our Bitcoin weighting? Uh, it's only 1%. Well, why is it so light? You know, and so um, I'm, I'm incredibly bullish on, you know, the outlook here for the next couple of years. Yeah. So with all that being said, right, I mean, there's a bunch of money that that's been waiting on the sidelines. Uh, right. It seems like traditional finance has kind of been, I guess, uh, on the edge of their seat waiting for this to be approved to kind of just dump a bunch of capital in. But we have that, the having, and then, you know, potential of interest rates getting cut by the end of this year. Uh, I guess like for, from a price appreciation standpoint, which of these factors do you think is, is the most important or do you think, uh, do you think that there's, uh, I guess, just a combination of the three can be for a potential of a, of a God candle? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and and let's let's take them one at a time. I mean, the TradFi thing, I, I think it's very interesting because I've listened to a lot. I listen to a lot of TradFi podcasts and I know a lot of TradFi people. And I, I know that, they, you know, one of the things and I just recently flipped, I don't know if you saw it, I flipped um, Chris Irons, who runs uh, quote, quote, the Raven, who was kind of negative on Bitcoin. I've, I think I've fully orange pilled him now. And, I think the TradFi world looked at it and said, well, it went to 68. It was a bubble. It, you know, when, when Bankman Freed blew up and FTX blew up, it went to 15. They said, well, it's definitely a bubble. And I think they've been, you know, I heard Danny Moses and some others on a podcast talking about it. And they, I think they've been very positively impacted by the fact that, gosh, it didn't die at 15. You know, it came from 15 right back up to 30. And it's, I mean, TradFi is now being forced to take a serious, serious look at it. So, I actually think that's probably the most important of the three um, because there's just so much money in TradFi. And as that, you know, that tipping kind of occurs, there's a lot of, you know, a lot there. Um, what were the other two points? One of them was the, was the Fed uh, or the, the having and the Fed um, and the Fed loosening. Let's do the having next. Um, yeah, the having's a big deal. I mean, it's, uh, you know, as we all know, the black reward goes down. It'll be in April sometime. Um, you know, there won't be as much supply. Um, and, you know, it, it, traditionally, we know pattern recognition wise, the last couple of halvings, um, there's been enormous ramps off of them. Although in both of those cases, actually, I remember I talked, I was just at Satoshi Roundtable and talked to a lot of people there. And they said, you know, and when the halvings occurred in the last couple of cases, it dipped first before it took off. There was a lag. It was a four to six month lag. I don't know. I mean, there, there's so many, you know, predicting the price of Bitcoin, it's a fool's errand. I mean, it's so hard. It, it's just so hard. It does. It, it's just a wild animal. You don't know what it's going to do. But um, but, you know, one thing is for sure, you know, a lower new supply and, and increased demand, you know, we know where that goes in terms of higher prices. And then probably, you know, the last one, which could be the icing on the cake is, is you know, monetary policy. And, and we all know Bitcoin is kind of a liquidity indicator more than anything else. I think it's a safe haven trade, but um, but it's it's, you know, it's driven by liquidity in the system. Um, we, we can see the correlation with that. And. Um, you know, the, the huge spike in M2 uh, coming out of the COVID crisis um, and, you know, the, the direct stimmies that they sent out, um, you know, drove it from 15 to 68. And, and of course, now M2 is shrinking very little, but it, is, it was shrinking until recently it started to grow again. And, 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 and that's a big driver of both gold and Bitcoin, which are related because they're both forms of sound money. And so, um, you know, Powell has basically said, you know, um, they're not, they're done raising. Uh, he said that in December and he even implied that they might be ready to start cutting. Um, the stock market took off and he, he probably wasn't very happy with that. And so he's walked that back a little bit. And, um, you know, now it's unclear when they're going to start cutting, um, but at some point they will. And I think, you know, the other thing that you can see going on is we see all the deterioration in the economy. It's slow, but it's there and it'll, it will grow. And, um, as it grows, you know, we know that eventually the Fed is not going to tolerate, you know, any kind of a serious recession or, you know, deflation um, and that they will respond with very aggressive monetary policies. They will take the rates down again. They will enter QE again. They'll probably stop doing the quantitative tightening that they're doing. They'll create new programs like they did with Silicon Valley Bank and so on and so forth. So so there will be more monetary looseness in our future, um, but it's not, you know, it's kind of it's, it's visible, but not happening yet. And I think that's part of what's going on now. I think to me, that's when that starts to really kick in, 
that's what drives. Let's let's say these things we're in right now get us from you know 47 to I call it 50 to 80 or 50 to 100. When that other shit kicks in, you know, we go to two or 300. I mean, it's just like I mean, because you know the the way that currencies fail, and that's really what we're talking about here is kind of the dollar slowly but surely failing in in sound money terms. The way that currencies fail is that over time. Um, people become less and less trusting in holding that currency, and and they they you know they, there's pattern recognition, and they can see that you know gasoline used to be a dollar, and then it was two dollars, and now it's four dollars, and next time around it'll be seven dollars, and so on and so forth. And and as a result, they know their currency is going down in value, and they you know the Gresham's law, they try and find a currency that's not going down in value, and you know Bitcoin is is the supreme currency with respect to that that issue. So so that's all coming, but but. You know, we got to we got to wait a little while because, you know, Powell wants to try to pretend that he's Volcker and he's he's in denial about how bad, you know, the economy and the commercial real estate market are. I mean, I, his comment about, you know, I don't think we have any problems with CRE. I mean, that was like that was like Bernanke saying subprime is contained. I mean, I, you know, I, I just saw I just tweeted out this morning a, a, a building in uh, Ak or near Akron, Ohio, sold for nine dollars a square foot. You know, I, I mean, this is. I mean, buildings cost between you know three hundred and eight hundred dollars a square foot to build, and this thing sold for nine dollars. I mean, this is there's there's trouble in commercial real estate land, and and somebody was holding the paper on that building, and that that money went to money heaven. So, um, you know, we're going to basically see, in in my opinion, um, a, an aggressive Fed response at some point to, you know, and, and when that occurs, you know, Bitcoin's going to just go nuts. It's gonna it's gonna go straight up. So. Um, but it's, you know, we got to wait for it. It hasn't happened yet. So this, I, I, did, did I answer the question in terms of yeah. <laughs> comparing the three? Yeah, you definitely, you definitely did. But I kind of want to get into to the Fed and the, the Fed policies you know, here, right? Because sure. I mean, you, you brought up commercial real estate. And so, you know, I, that's been something that's been obviously a, a red flag for me for, I guess, a couple of years now, especially since, you know, we saw the COVID pandemic, everybody moving out of office buildings, yeah. uh, kind of like the depletion of malls with online shopping. It just seems like a lot of commercial real estate is starting to fail or, um, you know, go down significantly in price, like you just pointed out with that example that you tweeted out uh, this morning. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess in a sense... Is commercial is the commercial real estate market big enough to cause something like a two thousand eight where that was more cause I guess on on the residential no. side? No, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, I'm trying to remember who did it now. Um, it was one of I think Sternlicht said that you know it looks like we've got about one point two trillion in commercial real estate losses. Hang on just a second, I gotta let my dog out. Um, you know, it, it's um, it's basically it's basically uh, um, not big enough to sink the economy on its own, in my opinion. And it's buried in lots of funny places, buried in, I, mean, I think it could sink some regional banks. I mean, no doubt, um, but they'll get consolidated into bigger banks. And you know, I, as I understand it from people I talk to in the industry, there's a lot of extended pretend going on and, you know, they're trying to cover it up and hide it. Um, but, and a lot of those notes are also held in kind of insurance companies and, um, you know, big pensions and so on and so forth. And, you know, pension funds don't go broke. I mean, the returns go down when they take a write down, but they don't they don't necessarily go broke. So there's not the same leverage as there was in 08, definitely. But, um, you know, at the margin, the, it's money being taken out of the system. It's money, it's value that it, that's going away. And, um, you know, somebody owned those buildings, somebody worked in those buildings, et cetera. And somebody held those notes. And that's money that's no longer in the system. And in a debt-based system, you have to have the money supply continue to expand or else the thing collapses. And so, you know, what I would suggest is that while it may not come in the same acute form that the 2008 thing did where the banks were levered 30 to 1, um, it's it's a drain. It's a drip, 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 drip drain on the, on the system. And it's just going to force the government and the Fed to keep things going. And I think it's a good point actually to talk about what's happened this year. I mean, the biggest surprise to me in calendar 23 was the stock market. And the biggest surprise to me is, is the economy. I, I was pretty sure that we had an enormous bubble that, you know, it, that kind of ended in December of 2021. And Powell started raising rates in January, February of 2022. And in early 2022, we had a pretty significant bear market in the stock market and stocks were down 25% or so. Um, and then something kind of changed in October and they started weakening the dollar and 
um, you know, doing things that injected liquidity into the system kind of behind the scenes. Um, and it's complicated. Um, you know, Luke Roman is probably the best guy to lay this out and explain. It. He's on Twitter. He does a great job. Um, then Silicon Valley Bank failed in March and the Federal Home Loan Board, you know, sent out a trillion dollars and they created this FT, you know, the print the money, you know, thing to, to save that. Um, and so, you know, they keep putting fingers in the dike um, as, as as the economy kind of bleeds out. And then and then the other piece that's really critical and uh, and has, has kind of changed my thinking a little bit recently is that the the federal government has just been spending like drunken sailors. I mean, the the deficits are just they're getting larger. You know, they half a, half a trillion dollars in Q4. I mean, you know, we're looking. I mean, with full employment and in theory a healthy economy, we had a 1.7 trillion dollar deficit last year. Actually, it's closer to two. Depends on how you count the student debt that the Supreme Court said. You know, Biden couldn't cancel, but Biden has overruled them and canceled a lot of it. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a situation where the you know the Fed. Um, and the government has really spent to keep things going. I mean, um, the, the growth in government spending has been just stunning. And remember, we had the debt ceiling thing come up about, I don't know, nine months ago. And and what they they were, they, I guess, intelligently from their point of view, what they did was they kicked it forward and they said, you know, we're not going to deal with this until after, until January or February of 2025. So more or less, we got no debt ceiling going on right now. We got no real fiscal controls in Washington, D.C., and everything I see implies that, you know, and, and of course, we got a president that wants to get reelected. Everything that I see implies that they just got their foot, you know, jammed to the floor on, on government spending to keep this economy going. And, you know, and give them credit. It's kind of working. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I, I think, of, you know, probably probably 15 or 20 percent of this country works for the government, you know, state, local or federal. So they're not going to lose their jobs. And then. You know, Biden's doing all these infrastructure programs, so they're spending tons and tons of money there. And, you know, it, it's just the, things kind of, quote unquote, hang together. Um, it's, you know, I, I mean, there, there are cracks, though. You know, you see consumer credit card debt has gone up a lot. Um, bankruptcies have started to go up a lot. Um, individual credit card defaults have started to go up a lot. I mean, you know, the, the interest rate, the, the significant interest rate bump has had an impact. Um, it just hasn't created a crisis, and I'm not really sure it will. Um, you know, it's it, it's not going to be. No two financial crises are the same. No two bubbles burst in the same way. I mean, I think we are in a bubble here, but I'm beginning to think that maybe this kind of ends a little bit more in a crack up boom, where um, the economy keeps going. People, you know, people full employment. You know, people can find jobs, um, but um, you know, inflation runs hot. And, 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 you know, the thing, the biggest, in my view, the biggest consensus view that I think is wrong is the notion that um, we're going back to a deflationary world or a, a deflationary environment or a, an environment of low inflation. You know, this is the econ guy, Rosie, and, you know, a lot of deflationists who kind of think, well, we had 40 years of deflation, it's going to continue. I think that ended in March of 2020. I think we now live in an inflationary world for two reasons. One, the biggest reason is labor. I mean, everyone's seen the cost of everything they buy go up. And if they have any power at all, they're pushing through major hikes. And, you know, I mean, the Fed says their inflation target is 2%. If you go and look at all these labor deals that have been done, you look at what the UPS drivers got, you look at what the airline pilots got, you look at, I mean, any labor deal, you know, they're getting between 6 and and 15% a year pay boost. You know, now maybe not for a bunch of years, but certainly in a, in a, for a couple of years. And so, you know, that that to me says, hey, um, how are you going to get inflation back to two percent when your biggest one of your biggest input costs is going up between you know six and twelve? You're not. Um, the other thing is you know natural resources are a big piece of the inputs that go into everything that we do, and we've really underinvested in natural resources for the last twenty years. And so I expect you know as demand starts to if, if demand stays strong, that eventually we're going to see much higher natural resource prices for oil and and so on and so forth, and that will be inflationary. So. Um, you know, to me, bonds are, are, are just like the worst investment in the world. I mean, right now, I mean, I, I mean, short term, they might work and they have worked, obviously, because, um, you know, when, when the Fed started talking about pivoting and lowering its interest rates, um, lowering the, the discount rate, um, you know, bonds caught a serious bid because we thought, OK, well, we'll front run this and, you know, we're going back to the old world. But I, I don't think we are. And by the way, just one other point to add there. The Fed absolutely is going to have to pivot on the bond on the interest rate, and the reason for that is just go look at a chart of the U.S. federal interest expense. I mean, it's just 
Um, they cannot, you know, running these record deficits with a 34, you know, trillion dollar debt burden, um, they can't afford, you know, and the average debt, the average interest rate on the debt right now is like 2.9, I think, maybe approaching three. And if you go look at the bond market, US, you know, federal or treasury bond market, you know, everything is a four or a five, you know, percent. And so, you know, that's that's going to increase, you know, the the interest expense of the US federal government. And that's a problem. So it was a long winded answer to your question, but I think I've covered a bunch of topics there. So no, 100 percent. And it was great. And I, and I, I kind of agree with you there. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of cracks surfacing here. Right. I mean, like, you know, credit right. card, uh, credit card debts going uh, bonkers. Um, mm -hmm. But for some reason, employment is staying somewhat sticky. Um, you know, even though Powell has kind of pointed that as that that as a factor of what he's going to look at when it comes to interest rates. Right. If employment starts to break. He claimed that he was, you know, potentially going to pivot because of that. But it seems like the consumer is somewhat resilient, I guess, based on the numbers, you know, uh, whether it's uh, whether you believe those or not, I, I don't really know. But yeah. with the stock market kind of rising through, it seems like there's a lot of delusion going on. Right. Yeah. Um, but Powell, in his latest 60 Minutes interview, and I kind of want to get to that if, if you've had a chance. Sure. All right. We'll give you a quick commercial break here to bring you the Bitcoin advisor. That's right. The Bitcoin advisor can help you make large purchases of the Bitcoin collaborative custody model to help you get your Bitcoin off an exchange and securely store it. So none of these things, you see Coinbase going down, you see all these places potentially running out of Bitcoin. We got to hurry up and get that shit off an exchange. So go visit me at content.thebitcoinadvisor.com backslash green candle. And you can set a meeting with me that's right, me, Brandon from Green Candle, and I can help you out and get everything set up. And if you decide to set up with us, if you come through me, I'll give you that first month free. So go ahead, set up that meeting, and we can help you out. All right, now back to the show. Yeah, no, I watched it and listened to it very carefully. Yeah, I mean, God, it's, it's so interesting to me that he can do so many things wrong and be so off and that people still take him seriously. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know, inflation's transitory. Oh, yeah, we blew it. We raised rates too late. I mean, now he's going to, you know, now he's going to, quote unquote, over tighten. I mean, he's he's driving a clown car and he's bouncing off both the guardrails, you know, of, of inflation and deflation. And yeah, it's 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 a mess. I mean, it's it's a real mess that he's got on his hands. And um you know, and there are a lot of conflicting signals. I mean, back to the employment thing, you know, some of those, well, first of all, you can't really trust the numbers because they're continually revised downward. Second of all, you know, there are two sets of numbers, one of which includes people who have more than one job and one of which doesn't. And some of it is people working two jobs to make ends meet, you know, to deal with all these higher costs. And, you know, you've also got something going on, which is you've kind of got my generation, you got the boomer generation retiring and, you know, being less active. And so the labor force has shrunk. And, um, you know, I've got some kids in, the, in their 20s and I've got a son, you know, um, who's changing jobs because the firm he's with has, has more or less exited the business. And I mean, he's, you know, um, deluged with, with job offers. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they're, I mean, they're having a lot of places around his in, this is in Boston Mass area, a lot of places having a hard time finding people. So it's, it's actually a reasonably tight labor market, um, you know, if you're young and willing to work hard. So, um, yeah, it's it's a. It's a very it's a very tricky economy with a lot of mixed signals. And, you know, I've, I've gotten it pretty wrong because I've kind of used my old model of how, you know, you had these cycles and bubbles bursts and stock markets went down. And I couldn't have been more wrong about that. I mean, the stock market has just kind of continued to motor on. And, uh, um, you know, there's 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 a lot behind that, though. I mean, some of it, you know, there, there are people. You know, there are people arbing it. There are all kinds of people doing VIX suppression schemes. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, it's I, I would contend that in today's world of all these financial derivatives and and so forth, that, um, you know, everything is going to everything looks fine until it doesn't. And and I don't know when the until it doesn't arrive. And maybe it never arrives. Maybe I'm wrong. But I kind of have I was around in the summer of 2000 or spring of 2000 and the dot com bubble was in full full bloom and roaring and all these stocks were going crazy. I mean, it was kind of like the Magnificent Seven, you know, and I don't know, Cisco was the NVIDIA of its day and so on and so forth. And, and um, I remember sitting with my partner just saying, you know, are we the last two guys in the world that think a stock is worth its future income? 
um, you know, just kind of future cash flows because this shit is nuts. I mean, and, and I and I thought to myself, you know, and and but and I actually kind of got to the point where I gave up. I was like, well, you know, this is never going to end. These are going to go up forever. And you know, we had sold whatever we could, and and we certainly weren't buying anything. I was managing money. We weren't buying anything at those prices. And um, and I, I, you know, God, I don't know. I mean, 2000, 2001, 2000, I mean, at some point it's going to end, but I don't know when. It turns out March of 2000 was the top. And it was interesting because um, that was the top, but it didn't really, it didn't really go down. It, it didn't really go down well until 2001, 2002. So, it, you know, I mean, and, and I kind of feel that way now. I'm like, I'm like, okay, you know, 6,000 SPY, sure. 7,000, who cares? And, you know, and that, and by the way, that's probably when it'll roll over and we'll have, you know, a turn in direction. But um, I've, I've given up trying to predict that. Um, you know, I prefer to play the whole thing on, because I think it, it wins in either environment, whether the market continues to roar or the market rolls over. I think that the sound money trade is is the best place to be right now, because I think if, if the market rolls over, they're going to print like crazy and that's going to help the sound money trade. And if the market doesn't roll over, it's because the economy is cooking and there's going to be a ton of inflation and that's going to help the sound money trade. So I kind of feel like, you know, the, the you know, forget trying to figure out when the market's going to roll over or not, just be in the sound money trade. <laughs> you know? That's, that's yeah. kind of how I see it. Yeah, like the sound money trade is almost like I can't miss at this point, right? It feels that way. I mean, I, you know, I, boy, I hesitate to say that because I don't want to jinx it. Well, I mean, of course. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you what I, what I tell new investors in my fund, and I'll, I'll say it to you, I'll say it to the listeners too. How are we wrong? Because you, when you're an investor, you always got to be asking yourself, how am I wrong? We are wrong. And, and you laugh. And everyone who I say this to, they laugh. They say, you know, that's really, we are wrong if the federal government gets really responsible and decides to stop the wars overseas and decides to cut spending and decides to means test social security and decides to raise taxes and decides to try and balance its budget. If those things happen, we're wrong. And our, and our, our trades do not work and we are you know, not gonna be well rewarded for being where we are. But think of those things I just listed and described. And then in your mind, you know, look at the constellation of our political system, look at the way the country is running right now you know, what do, what do you think the odds are that those things occur? I mean, I know, you know, I obviously think they're extremely low. I think most listeners would agree. And and so given that, I'm just not too concerned, you know, that this trade doesn't work. But but that is the risk to the trade, uh, you know, and if you want to look at both sides of the picture. No, and it makes 100% uh, sense, you know, and it doesn't seem like it's it's very likely scenario. But yeah, I mean, I guess it, it could we happen. Talking. I mean, you know. I'll tell yeah. you, I've, 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 I've thought lots of things in the world would happen and they didn't. I thought lots of things wouldn't happen and they did. So, you know, investing is about probabilities. You just you never know with certainty. And that's why you get paid when you get it right. And, you, you know, you lose money when you get it wrong. So exactly. And then, uh, you know, I you brought up a little bit about QE, right? I mean, it yeah. seems like the the uh, the money printer is drunk at this point where, you know, anything <laughs> a problem is going to happen, they're just going to turn it back on and it's going to fumble its way until, you know, like you said, the government has a spending problem. So they need to keep up that spending. Yeah. So they need more money in circulation. And, you know, all these these various factors here. So, you know, if we were to go through QE again, you know, I, I guess after the lowering the interest rate and turning on the money printer, if the, you know, if that kind of scenario happens, like inflation is already bad enough. Are we going to get to a potential of a place like, you know, where we, we could see hyperinflation in the United States? Do you well, think? yeah. So, so hyperinflation is the multi-year out case. I mean, let's just kind of start, you know, let's, let's start with the next up wave, right? The last up wave, I think we topped around 9%. On the printed CPI, and then now it's come back down into the threes and fours, threes, yeah, threes. Um, you know, I, I would actually, I think the 70s are kind of instructive because you kind of had three waves of inflation in the 70s, and so, and each wave was bigger than the last, and so, I, I believe that the next one, you know, if if what we're what I'm envisioning happens, which is to say that eventually the Fed has to pivot, and the because the economy is weak and there are problems. Um, you know, they start, they start growing M2 again rather aggressively. Um, you know, I think the next wave of inflation goes higher than 9%, very clearly, um, perhaps a lot higher, you know, maybe into the teens. Um, and, you know, I don't know what they do then, if they do another round of tightening or, you know, put in wage and price controls. I mean, you know, who knows? But, um, you know, we'll see when that occurs. But the point is that um, they tend to, you know, you tend to get these waves of, you know, inflation up, inflation down, inflation up, inflation down. 
but I think they're they're trending towards higher numbers all the way. And ultimately, you know, because of what we talked about earlier, the Gresham's law factor that people eventually lose trust in the system um, and they take their money out of the system, you know, that ultimately, you know, that's how you get hyperinflation. I mean, hyperinflation really is nothing more than everybody realizing the currency is worthless. You know, in Venezuela, once it's worthless, you know, you, they're printing so much of it, you can find it in the streets. I mean, it has no value anymore because nobody trusts it. And the reason the dollar has value is because people trust it. They trust the authorities, they trust the government, they trust the Fed. And I would, you know, I've seen plenty of charts that show how the trust in the Fed has been diminished. And I think it's going to just continue to be diminished in waves. And, you know, my, my hyperinflation prediction for what it's worth, um, and it really is, you know, not worth much because it's just a guess. But, you know, I think the dollar kind of fails in the early 2030s. That's, that's kind of, you know, what I think. I think between now and then we have, you know, just increasingly aggressive waves of inflation. Um, Luke Roman does a nice job. He calls it the U.S. with Argentinian characteristics, which is to say, you know, because politicians don't want to have a depression or a downturn, they're going to be aggressive. They're going to use, use yield curve control. They're going, to, um, they're going to print money. They're going to run deficits. They're not going to worry about it. And um, and that's fine. The economy, I mean, the good news is people will be working. People will be employed. The bad news is inflation is going to be a serious problem consistently. I mean, I, you know, you see this. I, I don't know who's going to win the election, but, you know, there's a there's some argument that Trump might because in the polls he's looked good recently. And, I mean, he recently said, you know, he thinks interest rates should be zero or negative. Right. I mean, that's I mean, look, the, the playbook is there. I mean, I think and, and with each. With each round of irresponsibility, that now becomes the norm and you can do it again. Right. I mean, COVID showed that, you know, guess what? We can send out stimmy checks to everybody in this country. You know, never done that before. That was brand. I mean, I think I was pretty brand new. Um, OK, so, you know, we have a crisis. People are losing, you know, their, their jobs. Um, you know, the economy is really punk. Um, inflation's running wild. Um, you know, people are begging for, for help. And we'll do another round of STEMI checks or you put in UBI, you know, for, for you know, universal basic income for poor people. I mean, you can just you can see where this is going. Um, and I, I think I think the government will always be able to spend money and meet its obligations and keep keep the system's wheels turning. But, you know, that, that's the that's the good news. The bad news is what's that money going to be worth? You know, as, as more and more people say, hey. You know, and, and I mean, if you if you read the history of hyperinflation in the, in the last days of Weimar, which was the German, you know, hyperinflation in 1919 to 1923, and people were getting paid and they were literally taking their, their dollar, you know, their Deutschmarks and going to the store to buy the food because they knew that a day later it cost more. You know, and that's when the currency is rapid. And some of that's going on in Turkey right now. I mean, Turkey is they're not quite in hyperinflation, but they're in very high inflation. I think the inflation rate was like 70 percent last year. I think anybody who, in Turkey who's getting paid in a lira, I think they're instantly converting that into either, you know, dollars, euros, or gold, or Bitcoin. You know, if they're young, they, they do Bitcoin, and and there was some of that in Argentina as well. And I know that occurred in Venezuela before their currency failed. And I think now Venezuela is pretty much on the dollar standard, which of course they're going to they're going to get it twice if they stick with the dollar. <laughs> but um, you know, so so yeah, the, that that is where I that's what I see the end game as being, unless. As I said earlier, government, a, you know, one, government gets responsible or two, you know, Roosevelt in 33 did a reset. And there's a possibility that, you know, we get some politicians in here like a Kennedy or somebody who look at this a little bit differently and say, hey, you know what? Our currency is getting destroyed. We're going to back it with something. You know, we're going to go back to backing it with gold or we're going to back it with Bitcoin. or We're going to back it with oil or we're going to get a commodity basket. We're going to do something that suggests that we're going to put some brakes on this thing. Um, you know, or, you know, we get some kind of a balanced budget amendment passed, you know, through Congress, you know, so that they can't, they can't spend it. Cause, cause really at the end of the day, it's the deficit spending that's driving, that's the problem. You know, the, the, I mean, the, the, the failure of a currency is nothing new. I mean, we have seen, there've been a hundred high inflations or hyperinflations in the last 150 years of recorded modern history. You know, it's happened all over the world. And, but it's never happened with the world's reserve currency before. You know, it was in Argentina or it was Israel had one or it was Hungary had one after World War II or you know, it was Weimar Germany. I mean, it, you know, Venezuela, it was Zimbabwe had one. I mean, you know, and, and, and the pattern's really usually the same. The government spends too much money. 
It's money they don't have. You know, nobody will loan them money because they know they're not trustworthy. And so they print money to cover the money they don't have. And then pretty soon the people who are accepting the money go, hang on a second. You just keep printing more of this. Why the hell should I hang on to this shit? And, and then eventually they all come to that conclusion and then, and then the currency is worthless. And so, so that pattern is very well established. It's predictable and it's understandable. What is different here is we're trying that playbook on the world's reserve currency. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take, because it's the world's reserve currency, you know, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to happen overnight. Right. If, if at all, but it, you know, it's, it's going to take, it's going to take time to manifest. Yeah. So with that, like, I guess, how do you think we get to a Bitcoin standard? Cause I see sort of two paths here. I yeah. see, you know, maybe we get like a dollar backed by uh, Bitcoin, real estate, gold, kind of what Kennedy lined out, which I think that might be difficult to implement. Maybe we could get into that as well. Or the fiat system just completely dies and people lose trust in it. And it's the global reserve currency. And then they look for an outlet, whether that's Bitcoin or, you know, some other type of currency in the interim. Uh, I think eventually we both here think that it's going to lead to a Bitcoin standard. So I guess like with the route that we're going, do you think that at a certain point we've gotten too far where the American people think like, you know, Robert Kennedy coming up here and proposing, um, you know, obviously Bitcoiners think like it would be great to back the dollar with Bitcoin. But yeah. I feel like a lot of Americans and a lot of people around the globe see that as almost like crazy unless that they're really. What's up, everybody? A quick break here to bring you the Orange Pill app. It's the number one app to connect with Bitcoiners all over the globe. What you can do is sign up using this referral link and connect with Bitcoiners wherever you're at. Whether you're at home, I'm down here in Tampa. I use it to connect with all the local plebs down here. But I'm also traveling around a lot, going to a lot of these conferences, maybe even just going on a little road trip with me and my pup. And I use the Orange Pill app to connect. I was just in London, connected with a bunch of Bitcoiners there, connected with a bunch of Bitcoiners at Bitcoin Atlantis and Madeira. Everywhere you go, everybody's using that Orange Pill app to connect with local Bitcoiners so you can find a local flair wherever you're at. So sign up using this referral link down below. It's even in the comments and you can get 10,000 sats just by signing up. That sounds like a hell of a deal. 10,000 sats to sign up and you get to meet with local Bitcoiners. What are you waiting for? All right, I'll see you on the app. Now back to the show. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it seems crazy until your savings and your currency are wiped out. And then it seems like, holy shit, what happened to us? And God damn, we, we, we got to get a currency. You know, I mean, look, once once the currency fails, everyone will be saying, you know, I think people most people will be smart enough to understand why it failed, which is they printed too much of it because and, and there will have to be some kind of a new currency. And if they come if they just come in with another fiat currency, they come and say, oh, guess what? Yeah, you're right. The dollar suck. But we've got dollar two and it's better. Everyone's going to go, yeah, but why is it better? You know, it's just it's just another form of the same thing. We don't trust that either. Um, you know, Brent, the, the way I see it going down is that they're going to be in parallel for a while, you know. Um, and and by the way, you know, we wouldn't want hyperinflation right now. We wouldn't want to try and go to, I mean, Bitcoin's not ready in terms of the payment rails and level two and lightning. I mean, Bitcoin right now is a very nice version, excuse me, of digital gold. In my opinion, you know, it's a great savings vehicle. It's a great store of value vehicle. Um, and, you know, and there's some really interesting technologies around it and layers on top of it. They're going to probably make it the world's reserve currency. But from here to the point at which it is that re reserve currency, you know, these things are going to operate in parallel for some time. Um, but I think what's going to happen is the people who've elected to save in Bitcoin are going to be fabulously wealthy compared to the people who've elected to save in fiat. But, you know, I suspect there'll still be dollar transactions right up until the day the dollar is completely worthless. Um, and, and, that, and that day could be 40 years away. I don't know. I kind of tend to think it happens in the 30s. I mean, if you kind of look at the slope of the pattern, you know, I, I think that. And, and then you also you've got, you know, the thing that's different in the, in the past was you didn't have kind of this instantaneous communication and this viral nature of, you know, the Web, the Internet, podcast, all that stuff. And so. So it could happen faster in the sense that, you know, I mean, it's it's like yelling fire in a, in a theater. I mean, once, you know, once once the fire really gets yelled and everybody goes, holy shit, this dollar is worthless. I mean, look, I mean, a perfect example of that, which kind of stunned me, remember when Silicon Valley Bank failed? So, I mean, 
basically, you know, a couple of venture capitalists got concerned about their balance sheet. Somebody, they, they sold some bonds that caused a write-off in their bond portfolio. Some smart analysts looked at it and said, hey, you know what? They got this amount of that, and that was the write-off. Oh, my God, this thing's bankrupt. You know, they, they've got serious negative equity here. And so, you know, a couple of high-level venture capital guys out in Silicon Valley who had a lot of their money in Silicon Valley said, said to all their companies and deposits, hey, get your money out of Silicon Valley Bank. And I think they had about $100 billion in deposits. They had like $40 billion of withdrawals in one day. I mean, this was, this was a digital bank run, right? This wasn't, this wasn't George Bailey, you know, in, in It's a Wonderful Life, you know, handing out money to the people trying to get their money out of his bank. I mean, this was people getting on the web and just saying, take me, you know, wire my money out. And, and, and the, you know, one day, 45 billion out and, and two days later, things bankrupt. And so, you know, I'm not suggesting that's going to happen with fiat currency and, and with the dollar. But but the point is, you know, word does travel more quickly. Um, and um, and you'd rather be early than late, you know, if, if that's the trend that we go on. I mean, you know, I can I could see a scenario. I know, you know, uh, there are people in the Bitcoin community who strongly believe that at some point, there will just there'll almost be no offer that will just you know will go from a hundred thousand to a million to two million just you know in in, in the blink of an eye and um, I, I don't know I, I actually don't hope it goes that way I'd rather see a much more balanced and sustained transition that gives the political system time to um, you know change the laws and change the rules and and you know everybody gets established on this new standard you know of, of monetary value. I mean, the one thing I will say, when we're talking about some stuff that people accuse me of being a doomer, you know, and say, well, you're going to be in hyperinflation. Um, look, I'm not happy about this and I'm not a doomer. I'm, I'm just kind of observing how, you know, monetary systems work and, and history. And, and I also want to say that on the other side of these things, you know, the world's going to be a lot better place. I mean, it really, you know, I mean, any hyperinflation, if you study them, and I have, um, you look at once, once the hyperinflation's over, you know, assuming you didn't, kill a bunch of people and have a war, you know, um, you, you more or less, I mean, you've got, obviously a lot, all the money has changed hands. A lot of people are poor, but um, usually what happens is you go back to a sound money standard. I mean, Weimar, for example, they went to the gold standard after that. And, you know, you recover. I mean, things and things get better quickly. I mean, people, you know, every day people want to get up and go to work and feed their families and live their lives. And so all we're talking about here is a broken monetary system that, um, is kind of, it's got itself in a doom loop. And um, the only way out is for it to kind of, well, is for either the government to get very responsible and fix it, which is unlikely, or for it to go to its natural course, which is the dollar becomes worthless. And, you know, people are very, very creative. I mean, the dollar becomes worthless. You know, we'll be trading in Bitcoin. We'll be trading in gold coins or silver coins. We'll be, you know, there, there will always be exchange. And, um, and, and once, you know, once the new system is established and people go, OK, this is money I can trust, you know, we'll, we'll go right back to being a very highly prosperous world uh, quickly, in my opinion. So so there's a bright side to it all. And it'll be a fairer world, too, because as, as you and I both know, you know, the current system really is, is it's kind of designed to create contillionaires and all the people who Wall Street and all the people who have access to the cheap money have just, you know, they've, they've destroyed the middle class. And, you know, you've got all these billionaires and then you got the rest of us. So um, so it'll be better, in my view. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think, uh, you know, everybody in the Bitcoin space somewhat feels that way. That's why we're we're so passionate about right. you know, in, in a sense. Right. But I think, you know, in this current system where we're at, it seems to me like, you know, these uh, crises are starting to get closer and closer together. Well, right. I mean, we had. 2000 the yeah. dot-com bubble 2008 it's, it's, it's a great there. observation yeah yeah, it's, a, yeah. It's, it's, it's like it's like the birthing contractions right i mean they're getting closer and they're getting bigger right i mean exactly. yeah i mean it took bernacki four or five years to print three trillion you know jay powell created what is it six trillion and you know 18 months right <laughs> i mean and yeah and the next one i mean i i can see the fed balance sheet at 50 trillion i mean i you know i think it, i think it'll get there I mean, I think at some point these numbers are going to just absolutely blow our minds um, because that's the way, you know, I mean, very few people understand compounding and very people, few people understand exponential functions. And, um, you know, as my friend Greg Foss says, it's just math. I mean, it's just it's really just math. And so so each blow up of the system means coming in with more money, you know, printing more you know, currency units to address the prior blow up and, and put everything back together. 
And, um, and that's why, you know, eventually all, you know, compounding functions go, you know, kind of asymptotically vertical. And, and that's, that's when it's over, you know, and, and that's, yeah, that's what's coming. Sadly, that's what's coming. But, um, you know, the, the, the bright side of it all, I mean, the gift that Satoshi gave us all was a, you know, a tool. I mean, he, the, you know, he created digital scarcity or they, because I, I think it's a bunch of guys that were Satoshi, but they created legitimate digital scarcity. And, you know, enough of the world has now figured out that that really matters. And the best, the highest and best use of that digital scarcity is, is money because you know money has value because it's scarce and um and so um you know this is the the best form of money that has ever been created and um you know it's it's going to basically destroy all other forms of money um and that's why you know sailor says it's going up forever laura <laughs> and i agree with him i mean i you know i, I completely agree with him no, exactly. And I, and I mean, just from like back to what we, we lined out at the beginning of this, right? I mean, you, you added a little wrinkle in there too with the, the spread of information. So we have the spread of information, right? The FOMO effect yeah. of Bitcoin going up. Then we have the ETFs, the halving, and then, uh, you know, uh, cutting of interest rates and potential QE, you know, I mean, like oh, that's yeah. quick break here to show you the newest ad I was working on with Bitcoin Racing and Panties for Bitcoin. All right, now tune in. later three two one go wheels are being uh, 40 up, yeah. fast medium left 50 downhill triple caution oh, oh. oh my god help me i don't want to die oh. something looks oh. wrong i mean he's running around like like he's on fire oh god please don't let the invisible fire burn my friend ah. oh, not out of the picture well, here. Well, QE, so. QE is coming and QT is coming. I mean, QE is coming and, and what yield curve control is coming because, I mean, if you think about how all this works, who's the sucker at the table? It's the bondholders, right? If you're printing tons of money and debasing the currency and your inflation rate's running really hot, you know, I mean, I know there are people right now who are thinking, oh, a 4% tenure, that's a great deal because we're going back to 2% inflation and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, I mean, we're going to a much higher rate of inflation, 4% tenure, you're going to lose a ton of money. I mean, Henry Kaufman in the 80s said bonds were certificates of confiscation, and they are, you know, and so um, who's going to buy those bonds? The answer is nobody. You know, the foreigners have stopped buying them, they've become net sellers. And, you know, there's really only going to be one party left to buy those bonds, and that's the Fed and the government itself. And at that point in time, you were literally just printing money to buy your own debt. You know, it'd be I mean, it'd be as if, you know, I I owed money to you and I could I could print it and just give it to you. And, um, um, you know, once that becomes widely understood and the fact that it's never going to go the other direction, it's all over. I mean, that's that's it. It's all over. I mean, it's you know, hyperinflation is not that complicated. It's when a quorum of the people come to believe deeply that they can never stop printing money at an ever accelerating rate. And that rate becomes so large and so obvious 
that those people literally they just they re, they run away from the currency unit. They literally run away from it. I mean, yeah, they'll hold it for as long as it takes to buy whatever they want to buy if that's what the store accepts. But for everything else, they receive it and convert it into an alternative. And ultimately, those alternatives become the new currency unit. Yeah. Right? And I think that's 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 what we're moving towards, right? I mean, there's it, no it, doubt. There's, yeah. just, there's absolutely no doubt. And as you say, the contractions are getting closer, and the and the and the bumps are getting larger. And but it, but it's still hard to tell. I mean, it's and the other side has, you know, they have a lot of tools at their disposal. I mean, they're they're pretty good propagandists, and you know, they can create new programs at the drop of a hat. I mean, I to to be fair, you know, I blew it last year. I thought Silicon Valley Bank was it. I thought we were going to go. We're going to moon on that. And man, they just put that thing right back in the can. I mean, you know, I mean, 17, I mean, they almost had a bank run on their hands. I, it was really fun watching it from my point of view because you just watched Janet yell and squirm. I mean, she, she, she had to be scared out of her fucking mind. Do you know what I, I mean? Seriously, she had to be because because remember how she talked about, well, maybe we'll do a, a nationwide deposit guarantee. Well, maybe we won't. I mean, they didn't want to do it, but they're trying to calm everybody down. Do you know what I mean? And and so they, they, they made it clear that, Look, if it's called for, we will do a nationwide deposit guarantee. Well, you know, the $17 trillion in bank deposits in the, in the United States. So if the Fed was going to guarantee, I mean, and the FDIC, that insurance fund that pays the 250, you know, it's like 180 billion. So 180 billion isn't going to cover 17 trillion of deposits, you know, their potential losses. And, you know, where are they going to find the 17 trillion? The Fed balance sheet's only seven or eight now. It was a nine at one point. I mean, they're going to print it. You know, and then what's that going to do? I mean, it's like the trillion dollar coin. I mean, you know, the, the, all, the only solutions they have involve the production of just a huge number of currency units. And currency units really only represent a claim on goods and services. And so, I mean, there are only so many goods and services. I mean, there's uh, people who can do work. There's oil that, you know, can be burnt and used. There's electrical. I mean, there's product. You know, there's just so much stuff in the world and, and labor in the world. And then there's money, which represents a claim on all that stuff. And, you know, all things being equal, if you take the money supply and you double it, you just increase the cost, of, you know, the price of all the stuff because the stuff didn't double. You know, it's, 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 not, it's not that hard, but, um, you know, they've, they've done a good job of fooling people and people are still investing in the rearview mirror. So I was at a luncheon yesterday with a JP Morgan financial advisor talking to a bunch of boomers about, where, where they should be putting their money. And I was just, I mean, it was just awful. I mean, I just, I, I wanted to scream. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, because his, his number one recommendation was buy long-term bonds. You know, uh, I, yeah, right. I, I just, it was like, and he, and his general consensus was that inflation had been solved. You know, he really believes that. I mean, because that's, that's the narrative. That's what they're saying. That's what Krugman's saying. That's what Powell is saying. And they're all saying, it, that, you know, Boy, we, we've landed this airplane. We've got a soft landing. Inflation solved. The economy's strong. Employment's good. Hey, it's all good. And you know, my my view is bullshit. I um, mean, you know, you, you guys, yeah, you guys, you make it look good right now, but you're just sowing the seeds of the next problem, and it's not all going to be good. So, you know, and I could be wrong, but that's that's how I see it. Well, I mean, I, I don't know the the scene from Wolf of Wall Street kind of pops in my head with uh, Matthew McConaughey when he's sitting there and he's like, you know, nobody knows if the stock market's coming up. It's all a mirage. It's Fugazi. Yeah. Fugazi. It's a Fugazi. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and right. that's basically what it seems like to me is this is. entire yeah. economy is just kind of you know a mirage that everything is good. Yeah. And, you know, we obviously we printed like 40 percent of the money supply. Right. We had like, you know, 12. What, what, what we talk about? Allegedly nine percent. Um, so, I mean, we haven't even hit that, I guess, that 40 percent mark that it would just yeah. be simple, oh, yeah. simple math at right. that point. And, you know, we're having assets appreciate even more than that. Right. right. I mean, at, at the rich are getting richer. The gap, uh, yeah. you know, housing is uh getting more difficult to get totally into. unaffordable right yeah for most people yeah. exactly and then you know the stock market it's like people think that they missed the boat or you know they they can't even uh you know the middle class can't even really invest in the stock market anymore yeah. because you know expenses are just so damn high so i think it's just this you know this mirage that everybody that's in the stock market you know that's like kind of managing these things and has enough money it's great for them you know because they're they're seeing everything appreciate at a at a rapid rate and they have all these assets, right. but that wealth gap, 
that nobody wants to talk about, you know, these money managers don't want to talk about, just keeps increasing yeah. and they're ignoring the little guy because that doesn't matter to them, right? That's I mean, right. they just, they little, just guy is, little guy doesn't have any money. Yeah. You know? and, and yet what they're going to, what they're going to end up with is a social revolution. I mean, is, you know, cause the little guy's pissed off. I mean, he's really pissed off and rightly so. I mean, it, um, you know, and you're seeing, you're seeing severe pushback. I mean, I thought, I thought what Texas did on the border was really, really fabulous. You know what I mean? I just, and, you know, look, they have the support of 20 plus states. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, look, the, the beautiful thing here, Brennan, that I, that I think, you know, we can all be extremely excited about is the way that decentralization is destroying these corrupt power structures that got built up in the 20, in the 20th century, right? I mean, you know, Tucker Carlson, right? He, he talks to Putin. He's got like, what do you have, like 90 million views? I mean, it's, it's insane. You yeah, know, I, I mean, I like mean, the, yeah, or the legacy media is like happy if they get a couple million viewers on any given night. And here you got a guy, an independent journalist getting, you know, tens of millions of views of his work. Right. And I mean, it's just, you know, and, and I mean, so and, you know, you can get on the Web. I mean, if, if you're if you're a human being and you're willing to open up your mind to all the possibilities of trying to discover the truth, you know, the Web and Zoom and all this other stuff have, have allowed us to discover it. Do you know what I mean? And I tweeted it out. Actually, it was yesterday's tweets. Uh, yesterday, I sent out something. That, it showed um, uh, the percentage of Americans who believe the government is telling the truth all the time or most of the time. And it's down to like less than 20 percent, like 80 percent of the 80 percent of the country doesn't. And that's probably the 20 percent that works for the government. <laughs> you know? I mean, 80 percent of the country thinks the government's full of shit. I mean, you know, this this can't last. I mean, this this system is gonna this system is gonna blow up and collapse, um, and and that's bad. But it's also good because we'll get a better one. You know, we'll. I mean, a lot of smart people here. Um, you know, if we can. You know, I mean, my major thing is just you know avoiding war. I'm very strongly anti-war. You know, and and okay, so if, if all the money's going to change hands and the system's going to change and come up in a new form, fine. You know, the trick is to somehow keep us out of a war because a lot of times when this I mean, this is a fourth turning, right? And a lot of fourth turnings, what happens is, and, and of course you can see the government trying to do this, you know, they try to distract you. They try and take you to war, right? You know, well, we've got to print this money because look, I mean, those, those evil people in Iran, we got to go bomb the shit out of them. And the, those Houthis are blowing up our ships and we got to fight back. And you know, Putin's awful and he's trying to reclaim land that used to be part of Russia and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's important that we try very hard, in my opinion, to not demonize other people in other parts of the world and to be, you know, peacefully oriented. And if we, you know, if we re, if we reshuffle the cards in terms of the wealth and the system and we make, we, we go to a system that's much fairer for everybody, um, you know, we, things will be pretty good in my view. I mean, uh, you know, the transition could be bumpy um, and, and it has been, but, but to be honest with you, it has been bumpy. I mean, you know, look at the people who lost their houses in 2008. Look at the, I mean, there's been, you know, people have been suffering. I, I think the middle class in this country has been suffering for 20 years, you know, and, and generally it's kind of getting worse, you know. And so, you know, much in my view, much better to go through a crisis and a reset and then to get to a better system than to continue with this slow bleed of bullshit and all these lies these guys are telling us, you know. So. Amen. And then, well, yeah. So, I mean, I could, I feel like I could talk to you uh, about all this stuff all day, Lawrence, but you've been very generous with your time. So I really appreciate you coming on for a second time here and having a great chat. So um, you've got a lot going on this year. So I don't know if you want to give everybody a peek under the hood. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as everyone knows, I make a lot of noise on Twitter. Um, I'm yeah. not very respectful of central bankers. So that's, you know, go there for, go there for humor and, and, and my vitriol on the central banks. Um, yeah, so what, what am I doing? I'm going to Madeira, um, speaker at that conference, and um, that's a great conference. I, they're just going to be good people there. I'm going to uh, Bitcoin Prague this year. Um, I'll be in Nashville this year, and I'll go to Pacific Bitcoin this year. Oh, and I'm also going to uh, Bitcoin Canada up in Montreal. So, um, yeah, my you know my shtick is I'm a sound money advocate. I'm doing this for my kids. I, I want to see us return to sound money because I think it'll fix a lot of the problems in society. And then on the, you know, the business, what pays my bills on the side, I run, I'm involved in two funds, one of which is called the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, uh, which I've got some partners um, who do more of the work there than I do, but I'm involved. And then I've got a, a fund that has more of a legacy silver and gold, although it owns some Bitcoin too, uh, a legacy silver and gold mining fund. I, I, you know, even before Bitcoin existed, I was in this sound money trade. 
Um, the only way to express that pre-Bitcoin was in gold and silver and gold and silver mining. And so, so I've got a background and a history in that area. So, but I pre and I, pre I appreciate very much the platform and, and uh, you know, I, I caution people to recognize that I'm wrong a lot. So, you know, yeah. don't, don't assume my time frame is like cast in stone. I mean, I, I thought, you know, if you told me the stock market was going to set a new record after 2022, I said, there's just no fucking way. It's impossible. And yet here we are. You know, record highs, right? Just it's all good. It's all a fugazi, right? It's all, it's all fugazi. fugazi. Yeah, right. It's okay. I mean, what do you say? You got to pump those numbers up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> somebody, somebody said to the people that are suppressing the VIX, "Hey, you guys got to pump those numbers up and get that fucking stock market to go higher because if that thing doesn't, if that thing doesn't go higher, this economy is going to implode." And and whoever it is, they've done a pretty good job of pumping them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, and I'll put all that in the show notes. So, Lawrence, thanks so much, man. Thanks a lot. Nice to see you, Brennan. Thanks so much for tuning in to this great episode. If you enjoyed this one and you want some more content, click on the link right here and check out my latest interview with Tom Luanga. We get into it all. If you've known Tom, he's a wild one, so stay tuned. And if you found some value in this podcast, please smash that like button. Hit that subscribe button so you get notified of the next videos. All right, I'll catch you at the next one.